All right, Magic Con, I'm gonna need y'all to go crazy for this next guest. Y'all know what it is. He was just out here. Y'all know, y'all, I'm gonna need y'all to stand up. Y'all gotta stand up on this one. Y'all gotta get hype for Mark Rosewater! Okay. Yeah. Okay, can you see it? Okay. Oops, sorry, go there, okay. Hello everyone, okay. I am Mark Rosewater, head designer for Magic the Gathering. And today, I'm gonna to talk about the 20 best mechanics of all time. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, but what, what exactly does that mean? Um, so let me lay, I'm going to lay down some ground rules. This is all my opinion, for starters. Um, and maybe if you ask me tomorrow, I'd have a different opinion. But today, this is my opinion. My panel, my opinion. Uh, so I am the head designer. So I'm judging the mechanics based on how they function from a design perspective. Power level, don't care. Frequency, don't care. Popularity, don't care. Flavor. Okay, I care a little bit about flavor. Okay, what do I care about? I want good gameplay. I want design space. We can make more cards. I want intuitiveness, that it, it makes sense what they do. I want enjoyability, that people have fun playing it. I mean, what mechanics just make magic a better game? Uh, there are a number of things I've decided to exclude. First up, no evergreen mechanics. I. Uh, too much of a list would be evergreen mechanics. It wasn't interesting. Um, but here are my top 20 evergreen mechanics. Take a quick picture. I'll do a podcast on this at some point. Uh, I do have opinions. It's just not for this particular show. OK, so no evergreen mechanics. No what I'll call tools. What are tools? Uh, no mana symbols. No card frames. No templating. Um, basically, I'm. I'm Doing mechanics, not tools are things you sort of use to make things, but they're not actual mechanics. I'm not doing card types, not doing super types, normal types, subtypes. So I'm not, none of that is, is I'm not counting that as mechanics. Uh, and I'm only doing keyworded um, mechanics and ability words. So sometimes we do things that are kind of, they're mechanics, but we don't name them. I'm not counting those. So I, of all magic, all named keyword and ability words that aren't evergreen, right now that aren't evergreen, uh, are fair game. Okay, with that out of the way, on with the top 20. Number 20, meld. Okay, so let me tell you a story. So back in August of 1998, I was making a set called Unglued. And I was trying to do weird, wacky things we had never done before. So I went to a lot of people in the company and I asked them, what could I do that was weird? So I went to the printing people and I said, is there any odd thing I can do? And they said, yeah, if you print two cards next to each other, the art can overlap between them. And I said, oh, interesting. So I made a card called BFM which stands for Big Furry Monster. And by the way, I put Big Furry Monster in there to clarify what BFM stood for. Because if you're a gamer, maybe it means something else. Um, anyway, it was, in our market research, the number one card in all of them glued. Or number two, I mean, number one and number two, they're two cards. I think left side beat right side weirdly, but okay. So, um, I was very fond of this. You all were very fond of it. And there also was a designer that was very fond of it, Ken Nagel. So Ken came in second in the first ever great designer search, worked at Wizards for many years. Ken really wanted to bring BFM technology to a, like, a non-unset. So in New Phyrexia, he made a mechanic called Link. And it had a left side and it had a right side. And any left side would go together with any right side. 
Um, LinkedIn ended up working out, obviously it wasn't new for Exia. It would be one of the things that influenced the making of host and augment later in Unstable. But Ken tried again, this time in Eldritch Moon. And what Ken realized was the key to cracking the technology was transformation. And so he made cards where if you got both cards out, they flipped into a giant card. Um, okay, so it's kind of cool to me that we got from BFM to, to Meld. So why is Meld my number one, my number 20? Why is it in the top 20? Well, today I'm gonna talk about a lot of important aspects of design. So this first aspect is Splash. Um, I think it's really important when we make mechanics, we want the players to get very excited by them, to be surprised by them. We need to think outside the box and we need to make the players go, wow. A little throwback for some older people. Um, so the thing that I really like about Meld is it is, when, when, the first time people see Meld, if they don't ever know of its existence, it just, their eyes light up. It's like, it's like what, can you even do this? And I just really love the, the, the amazingness of Meld. It just, it does this really cool thing that you don't expect and that is just, it makes this giant card, and it's just, anyway, it's awesome. It excites players. I think we need stuff like that, so it's my number 20. Okay, number 19, ninjutsu. Okay, our story goes back to February 2005. Uh, I was making Betrayers of Kamigawa. We were making it. Uh, the set before it was Champions of Kamigawa. So it had samurai, dragons, demons, kami, which were spirits, moon folk, and other unique Japanese mythology characters. But there was one thing that we purposely left out of Champions of Kamigawa. Everyone know what we left out? Ninjas, of course. Uh, so we decided to make Betrayers cool, we would save something just for Betrayers, and we would do ninjas. And if we're gonna do ninjas as a theme, we needed to have a ninja mechanic. But the question was, what do we care about? Like, what aspect of ninjas should we care about? Should we care about them being skilled fighters? Do we care about how deadly they are, they're assassins? Do we care about how quiet they are, they're kind of known for being in the shadows? But no, I decided to lean on sneaky because it plays into another aspect that's really important of design, surprise. So in a game of magic, there's a lot of things you're thinking about. There's a lot, like you can plan out a lot in magic. You, there's a lot of things you know. But we, we want to disrupt that, right? Every once in a while, we want things to happen that you don't expect to happen. That we want moments of tension and moments where you're like, something could happen, but I don't know when it's going to happen. We want to make you sweat a little bit, right? You, we, we want to make your opponent like, they don't quite know what's going to happen because the game's more dynamic if you don't. And Jinjitsu just has done a really good job of that. And it's been just a fan favorite mechanic and it just, it, it, it's kind of fun to go, any unblocked creature, who knows, it could be a ninja. Now that's really cool. So that's my number 19. Number 18, Cascade. Okay, so in Alara Reborn, we did something a little crazy. It was an all gold set. Every, literally every card in the set had a gold border, which was insane, but we did it anyway. Um, and we knew we wanted to do a mechanic for, for the Timmies and Tammies of the world. Uh, and that plays into another, another important aspect, thrill. That you, there, there, you want some excitement. You want some, like, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen and I'm, I'm just excited to see, uh, I, the player, want to see what's going to happen. And in order to make that work, you kind of want to use randomness. The problem with randomness is, if it's the wrong kind of randomness, people get kind of upset. You don't want to be too obvious in your randomness. But, there's a really good piece of randomness that Richard Garfield put into the game of Magic, the deck. You shuffle your deck, you draw in a random order. So there already was randomness built in. And so we said, could we harness the randomness of the deck to bring you a cool mechanic? So for those that don't know, um, Cascade, when you cast Cascade, you flip off the top of your library to get a spell that's cheaper than what you've cascaded, and then it gets cast for free. You get a free spell, but you don't quite know what you're getting, a la the thrill. Now, we made a small mistake, which was 
The idea was you wouldn't know what you're going to get, but you put magic mechanics in the hands of really good players, and they said, well, I could just put one of that in my deck, and then I know exactly what I'm going to get. So it's not so much thrill as... Uh, but um, we did, re we recently remade it. Like, there's something at its core really exciting. And whenever, by the way, there's a mechanic that did something really cool and then we evolved it, I'm showing you the original mechanic, even though obviously I mean Cascade and all Cascade-like mechanics. Um, but it really, Cascade did something that I think is really important, another aspect I look for, excitement, right? You want the thrill, you want to just, when Cascade is truly random, you don't know what's going to happen, not, not sort of the constructed thing where it's always the same thing, but when you don't know what's going to happen, truly fun and wonderful moments happen. Um, and that is why Cascade is my number 18. Number 17, a mass. Okay, so this one goes back to War of the Spark, May of 2019. Uh, so for those that might not know War of the Spark, the bad guy was Nicole Bolas. It was the big final chapter of the three-year Nicole Bolas story. And it was Nicole Bolas versus, like, all the Planeswalkers. And the idea was that he had an, an army of Eternals. These were dead creatures, an army he had made on Amonkhet. He used the Planar Bridge to bring them to Ravnica. And we really wanted to give an identity to the, the eternal creatures. Uh, so here's the one small problem. When you make tokens, if you make a lot of tokens, it really bogs down the game. And it really stalls out the board. But the whole point of the army was all these tokens, all these zombies. How do we capture that? So we talked about what we could do to the zombie tokens. We said, well, maybe they can't block. We do that from time to time. Um, maybe they have to attack and block together, so you can't just chump with one of them. Um, maybe they can't be boosted. Maybe there's something about them that they, you can't enhance them in any way. Uh, but we did none of that. We solved the problem through another way completely. We said, well, what if the army is only one creature? What if growing the army didn't mean getting more tokens? It just meant your token getting bigger. And it was a really novel approach that worked out really well. Um, and this plays into an important part of uh, mechanics, functionality. Your mechanics have to work. They have to, they have to work with the context of the game, that you have to make the game go forward. Um, magic, making magic is kind of like doing a jigsaw puzzle. All the pieces have to fit. And a lot of, I mean, there's an art to problem solving elegantly, and a mass was exactly that. It helped us take a problem that we spent years trying to solve, and we did it in such a, a, a cool and clever way that it did the flavor we needed, but it didn't have the mechanical problems that we, we could, needed to avoid. Um, and so a mass is my number 17 just because it just solved a really hard problem in a really elegant way. You'll notice we used the mass again in Lord of the Rings. And while I won't say when or where, a mass will return again. It's just really effective. Uh, and it's proven to be a really strong, uh, cool mechanic. Okay, that brings us to number 16, Threshold. Okay, so this takes us back to Odyssey, uh, back in September 2001. It was the graveyard set. Um, now, Richard Garfield, some of you might know, the creator of Magic, he had an interesting idea, something he was milling around in his brain. He wanted to do something where something happened later in the game. It was kind of on a clock that it would happen. But what Richard was trying to figure out is, well, he wanted something that would naturally happen over the course of the game. He wanted something the players could influence because he wanted to interact with it. And he wanted something easy to track. And after thinking about it, he came to the solution. The answer was the graveyard. Well, conveniently, we were making a set about the graveyard. And so um, there's two ways you can care about the graveyard. One is what we call resource and what we call barometer. What a resource means is I spend it. I, I actually exile cards from my graveyard. I'm eating up my graveyard. That is a, a resource I'm spending. A barometer means I just care what's there. You know, like Lorgoyf counts the number of creatures in your graveyard. It's not depleting your graveyard. It's just looking for what's there. And what Richard needed for this mechanic was a barometer mechanic, not a resource. Because the resource chews things up, and then you have to fill them up again. He wanted something that slowly evolved. So for example, this is a were rare. You'll notice that he gets bigger. He's a 1-1 one, one that taps for mana, but he gets plus 3, plus 3 when you have seven or more cards in your graveyard. That's what threshold means. 
so if you have seven more cards in your graveyard. Um, and the barometer approach worked really well. It was nice because when you start the game, you have no cards in your graveyard. As you do things, as you cast spells, as creatures die, your graveyard naturally fills up. So it was a very clean and, and you can just count the cards in your graveyard. That's an easy thing to monitor versus lots of other things you can monitor. And the cool thing about it is um, threshold effects could work in many places. You, they work on the battlefield, the graveyard, the hand, the exile. The idea of the concept of a threshold, meaning I need to have something somewhere, is very powerful. So much so that we now refer to these kind of mechanics as threshold mechanics. Um, and this brings another important thing. You need inertia. And what I mean by that is you need the game to end, right? You need to make sure that the mechanics you're making pushes the game toward an end state, pushes the game to end. And if the mechanic doesn't do that, it's going to cause problems. Um, you want, it's really nice to have things that can grow with time. So as the game progresses, cards naturally get more powerful as the game goes along. And we've used threshold in lots of different places. Threshold mechanics are a staple type of mechanic we do now, where now they, they care, about, once again, about different things. They care about different card types. But it's a really good tool that we've used, and it's become like just another important tool in our tool belt. And that is why threshold is number 16. Number 15, prowess. OK, so we go back to Khans of Tarkir. We had the Jess guy. The Jeskai had two traits. They were very smart, and they were good fighters. So that meant we wanted to involve spells. That's how we make them feel smart. And we wanted to work in combat. OK, well, how can you involve spells and work in combat? Those at first don't seem to be connected. Uh, but we found a way. So what prowess does is every time you cast a non-creature spell, it makes the creature get plus one, plus one. And it does a lot of really cool things. When I attack with a prowess creature and I have mana open and cards in my hand, you don't know. Once again, I talk about how surprise is important and not knowing things. And it just worked really well. Um, it solved another problem we had, which is um, every color, we like to have overlaps between colors. We like to have keyword mechanics in evergreen that overlap. Uh, and we do stuff like um, hybrid cards. It's nice to have them. Blue, red didn't have anything. And it fit right in there. So it also solved that problem. Uh, so we made it. We went from being a set mechanic right away to the very, it became an evergreen mechanic. Um, and for a while, it was just, it was an evergreen mechanic. But we ran into some problems with it. One is a triggered mechanic. No other, ever, no other um, of our evergreen mechanics are triggered. It's stacked. No other, like, lifelink used to stack, but it doesn't anymore. Um, and it often got in the way of set themes. We kept finding ourselves saying, well, in this set, we can't do uh, prowess because it would get in the way of other themes. So what happened was we ended up moving it from evergreen to deciduous, which is why it can be here. If it was evergreen, I couldn't, I couldn't vote for it. Um, and it plays in another important aspect of design, we overlap. A lot of cool magic is about um, figuring out different things you need and then figuring out the intersections of them. We want to do spells. We want to do combat. Well, how, how do we marry those? And that this, this is just a very clean overlap mechanic in a way that was really nice. Like, you don't often get this, this clean. And this is just such a nice, clean mechanic. Once again, magic is a jigsaw puzzle. And sometimes you have space for one piece, and you have two components. And that's why overlap as a key helps you solve things by sort of fitting two things in one slot. That is why I picked prowess as number 15. Number 14, raid. OK, this also is Khans of Tarkir, different clan. This time the Mardu, right, red and black. So they were fast. They were a military threat. So fast meant we wanted to encourage aggression. And military threat, once again, we wanted to involve combat. One of the themes is combat was the theme of Khans of Tarkir. So all of, the, all of them involved combat in some way. Um, so we were thinking about, OK, how do, we, how do we do this? How do we involve combat? We could um, care about dealing combat damage. We could do attack triggers. We could care about being tapped. We could care about getting blocked. We could care about damaging another creature. But here's one of the truisms of design. Sometimes you just you want to do the obvious thing. And so the answer to this problem was literally just care about attacking. The mechanic just says, 
Did you attack? And if you did, it rewards you. Well, it encourages people to attack because it bluntly says that. And bluntness is another important tool. Sometimes you just want your players to know what to do with it. Um, and not all, I mean, there's times we're not blunt, but sometimes you just need to be blunt. And Raid did a good job of like, you understand you're supposed to attack, it literally says to attack. That is why Raid is number 14. Number 13, Changeling. Okay, so this is back in Lorwyn in 2007. Um, okay, so there were eight creature types that we cared about. Kifkin, Merfolk, Goblin, Elemental, Elf, Giant, Fairy, and Tree Folk. Um, and we found a, a big problem when we started drafting the set. Okay, let's say there's eight drafters, each wants to play a different, they're not even overlapping, each wants to play a different thing. Okay, you open up the pack, everybody takes their card, and there's no fighting. That's a problem. Um, you want different people to want the same card. If only the goblin player wants the goblins, then every time they play the set, it's the same deck. They, they always get the same cards. So we knew that we needed glue. This is another thing we look for in design. We wanted some glue that could help connect them together. So the first thing we thought about is, in the past, we had done some things where you choose a creature type. Well, maybe you choose a creature type. That way you could choose whatever the eight you wanted. But with eight different creature types, it got kind of confusing. It didn't play well. Next we tried, well, what if we have two different creature types on one card? That one card cares about two different things. And we did do this a little bit in the set. Um, and it was slightly better. Now two people are fighting for it. But it still didn't solve the problem. So we had a, I thought back, a lot of times in Magic, when you're trying to solve a problem, you're like, have we solved this problem in the past? And there was a Magic card that it did, in fact, solve this problem. Misform Ultimus from Onslaught. So this was a legendary creature. It was a one-of card. And it just said, I'm every creature type. It was in a, Onslaught was a set all about creature types. It was a typal set. And, and we, we made one card that just, there were a whole bunch of moon folk that could, you could pay one to make it whatever creature type you wanted. But this was like the super of them. And just, it could, it just got to be everything. And the lesson here is, you have to be willing to reuse what worked. Um, that you don't always want to reinvent the wheel. Like, we had a really good way to do it, and like, why not just make this into a whole mechanic? And at the time, I got a lot of people fighting with me. They're like, won't that make Mistborn Ultimus less special? And I'm like, yeah, but I, I, I don't have the freedom to make every card super special. I need to make more magic sets. And it, it worked as a mechanic. Um, that is why Changeling is number 13. Number 12, the Monarch. Okay, so... Uh, in Conspiracy Take the Crown, the second Conspiracy set, August 2016, uh, it was inspired, Richard Garfield, back in August of 1994, made a set called Vampire the Eternal Struggle, originally called Jihad, later called Vampire the Eternal Struggle, based on a role-playing game called Vampire the Eternal Struggle, where you gotta play vampires. And in it, he made a mechanic called the Edge. And the idea of the Edge was, it gave you, the player, a special ability but there's only one of it. And in order to get the edge, you had to take it from another player. And so in the game, people would fight over the edge. And I really liked the edge. I thought it was a really good mechanic. So I said, I have a set for the edge. Ixalan. Originally, Ixalan was not four factions, but three factions. And they were going to fight over a resource. And that was Ixalan. But before Ixalan came out, um, Sean Main who you might know, he, he came in second in the second grade design research. He was working on Conspiracy Take the Crown. And he's like, Mark, could I possibly use the edge mechanic? Um, I'm making a multiplayer set. And you know what's really good in multiplayer set? You know, things like the edge mechanic. And so I said to him, OK, make the mechanic, and then we'll talk. He made the Monarch mechanic. Um, and in the end, it just made more sense to be there. And so Ixalan had a fend for itself and had to get other mechanics. Um, now, one of the things that you want to do when you're making magic design is you want to encourage the players to do the things that will make the game go the way you want it to go. So once again, remember inertia? You want the game to end. You want to encourage them to do things that will help push inertia. So one of the problems in Commander 
is it's a political game, and there's not always a lot of reason to attack that kind of without any outside enforce, a lot of commander games, because that's everyone sits around, builds up, and is afraid to sort of do anything. Because the second you hurt somebody, now they want to hurt you, and like, there's a lot of disincentive to attack. And that one of the things we need to do is we need to make mechanics that sort of force people to attack in commander. And Monarch is just the, I mean, we've made code, we've made other, it's not the only mechanic, but I think it's, I, I went to the, the casual play design team, and I said to them, what is the best mechanic for making people attack in multiplayer? And they all said Monarch. So that is why Monarch is my number 12. OK, number 11, Living Weapon. So we made a set called Mirrored and Besieged back in February 2011. It was a war between the Mirrens and the Phyrexians for the sake of the plane of Mirrodin. Um, now, for those that know the story, uh, the story starts with a lot of cute little Mirrens and ends up with a lot of meaner looking Phyrexians. Um, but in Mirrored and Besieged, we did a really cool thing. So at the pre release, you chose whether to be a Mirren or a Phyrexian. Half the set were Mirren cards, half the set were Phyrexian cards, and you picked which side you wanted. Um, if you picked the Mirrens, you got a Mirren booster. If you picked the Phyrexians, you got a Phyrexian booster and you literally only got cards of your half the set. So we decided we wanted a mechanic for each side. So for uh, the Mirren side, we made Battle Cry, which was, it made you want to attack. And for the Phyrexians, we made Living Weapon. Okay, now Living Weapon was trying to solve a problem. Let me walk you through the problem. Okay, so when you build a deck in any format, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about limited, but this is true of any deck building. About 40% of your deck is gonna be land or some mana. Um, usually about 40% of your deck is gonna be creatures. Obviously different decks do different things, but I'm talking like a default deck. And about 20% is everything else. Once again, 20% is everything else. So if you're gonna play equipment, you have to put it in this group. Now, in limited is 40 cards. Um, you get seven non-creature spells. Seven, that's not a lot. Um, and most of them are usually creature kill, maybe a little bit of card drawing. You just don't have a lot of room. It's hard to get equipment, room for equipment. Um, so we needed to solve that problem. Once again, we're looking for overlap. How do we make equipment but not take up non-creature space? How can equipment fill a creature slot? And the answer was germs. <laughs> Uh, little zero, zero tokens. So the idea was the equipment came on the battlefield, came with it a creature, and l automatically attached to it, meaning it was a creature. When you played it, it was a creature. Now, when that died, it, it was an equipment. You could equip it to something else. But because it came as a creature, you could put it in a creature slot. Um, we've done this trick again. For Mirrodin was a whole other name mechanic that did it. Um, but you'll notice it's, We've learned the power of turning equipment into creatures this way. Uh, it's a very good way to get them into your deck so that you play them. And that is why number 11 is Living Weapon. Take a sip of water here. Okay, number 10, Devotion. Okay, so the story starts in Theros. Actually, it starts in Eventide. No, actually, it starts in Future Sight. No, actually, it starts in Dissension. So there's a man named Aaron Forsyth who was up here earlier on the stage, my boss, the VP of design. Um, in Dissension, Aaron designed this card. Um, you revealed any number of cards from your hand, and you gained two life for each green mana symbol that you showed. And Aaron, you just made this for like a one of in the, in the set. And I said, no, Aaron, this is so awesome. This is a mechanic. This isn't one card. We got to save this. So we didn't put it in Dissension. A year later, we were making Future Sight. Future Sight did this thing called Future Shifted Cards, where we showed you glimpses of the future. And I knew I wanted to do this mechanic, so we put it on a card called Phosphorus Feast, and we put it as a Future Shifted card, teasing the future. A year later, we're doing Eventide. 
and um, the Shadowborn Eventide had a hybrid theme, and so it really played nicely with um, Symbols Matter. So we decided to take this card and we put it into Eventide. But now we named it, we called it Chroma. And I knew in my heart of hearts this was an awesome mechanic. I was so excited to save it, and I, I knew the response we were going to get. Parades, people were going to love it, dancing in the streets. Uh, but instead, that, that is not what we got. Nobody really liked Chroma. Uh, and it, you know, wah, wah, wah. It just, no, it, it, it did badly in all the surveys, and it's like, oh, too bad. Okay, now we get to Theros. So Theros is the Greek mythology set. And we were making gods. Like, how do you, the gods, heroes, and monsters was our tagline. How do you, how do you make gods? Um, we had a whole bunch of them, and we knew we wanted to connect them in some way. Um, and we loved the idea that what made the gods powerful was the people believed in them. We thought that was a really cool element. In the world of Theros, the more faith you have from your followers, the more powerful you are as a god. Um, and we thought the idea of doing Chroma came up. Um, but we, Chroma had some problems, so I said, okay, Let's go back and look at Chroma. Chroma has some issues. Number one, got no flavor. Chroma literally means color in Latin. Not super flavorful. It had no consistency. Well, if it's on the battlefield, it kind of wants to be a permanent, but if it's in your graveyard, it kind of wants to be a spout because it's easier to get there. Um, it was hard to build a deck around it. And so there, there was no really build around. I said, okay, well, what if we could change things? What if we gave it flavor? What if we gave it consistency? What if we made it something you could build around? And so we made devotion. So what we said is, okay, it represents the devotion of the people for their gods. Devotion, that's a flavorful thing. It only goes on permanence. So you're only looking on the battlefield. Now it would be something you could build around. And we took a second shot at it. How did it go? Yay! This time, people loved it. It was one of the top-rated mechanics in the set. Um, so the important lesson here is execution matters. Um, it wasn't that Chroma, at its core, was a bad idea, but how we executed on it was bad. And the reason I didn't list Chroma as the best mechanic is it wasn't a success. It wasn't the thing that led to what we did. We kind of made devotion despite Chroma, um, but it really shows the importance of if you do something like, we as designers can mess up. We can do things wrong. And from time to time, we got to look back and say, was there a good idea that we did badly? And Devotion was one, I mean, well, Chroma was one of those, but Devotion saved it. And so Devotion is in my top 10. Number nine, Convoke. Okay, so Convoke was in Ravnica, original Ravnica. We just talked about that in a previous panel. So that was the city that had guilds in it. Um, there were four guilds in original Ravnica, the Boros, the Demir, the Golgari, the Celesnia. Um, Richard Garfield, again, he, he shows up a lot. He's a good designer. If you guys never heard of him, good designer. Um, he was trying to solve this problem for a while, alternatives to mana. Like, are there other ways you could spend things that are cool? A lot of the problems was spending life is a problem, you start with 20 life. Spending cards is a problem, you start with seven cards. And he's like, is there something that you build up over time that's not mana? Obviously, Threshold was a different thing he built up, but he realized that creatures were very interesting. That creatures had utility, that if you didn't attack with a creature, you, know, you could use it in some other way. And the idea of Convoke is, if you have a creature with Convoke, you can tap creatures in place of spending mana. So it allows you to turn creatures as a way to cast them. Now, why is this so important? Oh, real quickly. Uh, so Richard, by the way, actually did not turn it in for Selesnia. Does anyone know what guild Richard turned it in for? Boros is correct. He originally, his idea was military teamwork. That was the flavor he had. Um, I was more enthralled with the idea of cooperation and it didn't feel like it fit Boros quite as well, so I moved it into Selesnia. Also, 
So, so Lesny, I mean, white, green, and red are all good at this, so Boros and Selesny both could have done it. I moved to Selesnia. Okay, why is this important? So in Magic, we have something we call a curve. The idea is when you play Magic, you want so many cards at each mana value so that over time, you have what you need. And you play more of things lower in the curve and less of things higher in the curve. That you don't get a lot of cards high in the curve. So um, let's say you have a 5-5 five, five Trampler. Uh, it costs six mana. Um, so you can't play it till you have six lands. At the earliest, that's turn six. So that's, that's late in your mana curve. Sometimes you know, later in turn six, you don't always draw land. Um, so you can't put a lot of those in your deck. If you can only cast it in turn six, you can play one, maybe two. You can't play a lot of them. But let's look at Convoke. This is also a 5-5 five, five Trampler. But now it's possible to play it before turn six. You can play other creatures, and you can play it. I'm less reliant on drawing land. And you can play it at a lower, you can, you know, you can slide it lower in your deck. Now, this is definitely a mechanic we've used in lots of different places. It was in the core set. It was the first returning guild mechanic. And it's just been a very useful mechanic that we've used in a lot of places. So that is why Convoke is number nine. Number eight, Proliferate. Okay, so in Scars of Mirrodin, Remember, this is the Frexian War. I talked about Mirrodin Besiege. That's once the war started. This is the set before it where the Frexians were there. The war hadn't started yet. Um, now, the Frexians first showed up in um, Antiquities. And over time, they got a little scarier looking. Um, in Invasion, the, the end of Invasion, that's the Weatherlight Saga, Urza, through all his machinations, wipes out the Frexians. All the Frexians are gone. But there was one small problem from a world-building standpoint. We like the Frexians, they're good villains. So we had a master plan to bring the Frexians back. So what we did is we had Karn, not realizing it, bring oil to Frexian, to Mirrodin when he made Mirrodin. And in the first novel of Mirrodin, we subtly hint uh, the bad guy in like page three finds some oil and it sinks into his skin. And we don't talk about it again. Um, but we were laying the seeds for the Scars of Mirrodin story. In Scars of Mirrodin, all of a sudden, the Phyrexians start showing up on Mirrodin. Like, what's going on? We thought the Phyrexians were gone. Uh, but there was a new brand of Phyrexians. The old Phyrexians, led by Yogmoth, were mostly black and artifacts. This time, we spread them through all the colors. Their leader was Elish Norn. She was a white Phyrexian. Um, so we were trying to figure out how best to communicate what Phyrexian means. And what we decided was, we li I, I like metaphors. If you all me read my stuff, you know I love metaphors. And to me, the best metaphor for the Frexians was disease. That they spread like a disease. They're, they're viral, they're toxic, they're adaptive, they're relentless. They act like a disease. They're sort of a multi-planar disease. Um, okay, how do you represent disease? So we use minus one, minus one counters. Creatures get sicker. And we use poison counters. Players get sicker. So I made a card. It was called Infection Spreader. And it just, it said, well, any creature that has a minus one gets another minus one. Any player that has a poison gets another poison. I'm spreading disease. These are the things that, rep that represent disease. It played well, so I made a second one. That yeah, played well, so I made a third one. And then eventually I was like, okay, let's just make a mechanic out of this. So the mechanic made all minus one, minus one, and all poison counters get one more if you decided. And then Mark Globus, who was in the first great designer search, he came in fourth, I believe. He said, why stop at minus one, minus one, and poison counters? Why not all poison counters? And I said, you're correct. Why not all poison counters? Uh, and so one of the cool things is the way that proliferate works is when something proliferates, you look at any permanent or any player, and if they have a counter on them, you could choose to make another of that type of counter. Now, in Scars of Mirrodin, once again, we care about minus one, minus one, and poison counters. But years later, we made War of the Spark, and that cared about plus one, plus one counters and loyalty counters. It had a Planeswalker theme. And then last year, we had Phyrexia All Will Be One, and it cared about poison counters and oil counters, a brand new kind of counter. That one of the things that Proliferate's been so good at being is flexible. 
that it really, like each of those three sets are very, very different. You cannot confuse, you know, Scars of Mirrodin with War of the Spark. Yet Proliferate works really well in both of them. And it's a fan favorite mechanic. It, it just, it's just a very fun mechanic. It's rated high every time we've ever done it. Um, that is why Proliferate is number eight. Number seven, Monstrosity. Okay, so we go back to Theros. I talked about how we have the gods. Um, but, like I said earlier, gods, heroes, and monsters. We also had the monsters. And we really wanted a monster mechanic. So once again, remember the curve. The problem with monsters a lot of time is if you want them to be big, they're high up on the curve. That's the problem. So we said, is there a way to move them down the curve? So the answer we came up with was monstrosity. So the idea is, this is a four mana creature, 100 hand and one, but it has a monstrosity cost. So it's a once a game cost. We had done once a turn, um, but we had never done once a game. And the idea is, I mean, we had sort of done once a game, but not in, in mechanic this way. Um, and the cool thing about this is when you do the monstrosity, you essentially make another creature that you have a 3-5 that becomes a 6-8. And it allowed you to have a cheap creature that you could cast cheaply earlier in the game and a bigger monster that you can get later in the game. Um, and it, we've used this technique in other mechanics that there's a lot about sort of growing things and giving you cheap creatures that later become large creatures. Um, and it, monstrosity has been such a boon to us that the idea of the once a time upgrades is something we've really embraced and it's something that has influenced a lot of design that came after it. We even once made a, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly, it's, it's, for those rules people out there, it's slightly different, but um, we made a DAP which was essentially monstrosity with one or two tiny changes. Anyway, that is why monstrosity is number seven. Okay, number six, morph. Okay, in alpha of August 1993, this guy, Richard Garfield, made two cards, Camouflage and Illusionary Mask. Both of them had you turn cards face down. What did that mean? Ah, Richard didn't really say what it meant. The card didn't say what it meant. It was very vague what it meant. And for any of you that have been playing for a long time, early Magic, the rules were not as clean and as clear. And these two cards, no one knew how they worked. Everybody would play it differently. And so um, we decided we have to figure out what, the, what does it mean? What does a face down card mean? Somebody had to answer that. It was undefined. So the rules team came about and they said, we will answer this. And so after much discussion, they had a really clever idea. They said, what if it's a 1-1? One, one? That's what it is. A face down creature is a 1-1. One, one. And the idea was they came up with this mechanic where you could spend two mana to play a card face down as a 1-1, one, one, and then you could pay its cost to turn it face up. So they, they, they were very excited by this mechanic. So they went to all the designers at the time, and they said, do you like this mechanic? And one by one, R&D told them they did not. But there was young, one young upstart that actually really liked the mechanic. That, that would be me, that's young me. Um, I really liked the mechanic, but I said to them, like, one change. One one's kind of wimpy. How about instead of two mana for a one one, we make three mana for a two two. They said yes. And then what I did is I designed a whole bunch of cards. Um, I actually, did, the idea of doing um, morph triggers, I designed morph triggers. I made a whole bunch of cards. I made a bunch of pre-constructed decks and I started playing it with R&D. And as they played it, they slowly warmed up to it. Now, the reason I think this is so important is you want some mystery in your game, that everything shouldn't be known. So in game design, there's a term, what we call perfect information. Chess is a perfect information game. What that means is that you know everything. You can think eight turns ahead because there's no information you don't have, uh, I mean, other than what your opponent will do, I guess. Um, and then there's imperfect information. Br Bridge is my example here, where I don't know, my opponent knows something that I don't know. Um, we also refer to imperfect information as hidden information. So in Magic, Richard was smart. He built in hidden information. It's very important. Your hand is that hidden information. I know things you don't know. Um, you want the stimulation. You, there's a lot of things in game design. You want to inspire people. You want people thinking. That's really important. And what we learned is face down in the hand is great, but it doesn't stop there. What Morph taught us is 
face down could leave the hand. You get a face down in play. You get a face down in exile. You get a face down in many other places. Um, and that idea really spurred lots of different mechanics. Like uh, Fortel and um, lots of different things came out of the idea of that. And that is why Morph is my number six mechanic. Okay, now we get to the top five. These are the heavy hitters. Okay, number five, kicker. Okay, in Invasion, this is Bill Rose. I mentioned him earlier. He didn't like Morph, but Bill, Bill did some, Bill didn't like Morph, but he likes other things. So um, Bill was really fascinated by the card Fireball. Here is why. For, by the way, for this example, assume you draw land every turn. On turn two, it does one damage. On turn three, it does two damage. Then three, then four, then five, then six, then seven. Every turn, it does more damage. As you get more land, it does more damage. The spell changes as you get more land. And that turn three is very different than what the card does on turn seven. That the idea that there's an early game and there's a late game, and that one card can be both early game and late game. And so Bill's idea was, well, what if we took an early game card and we stapled on a late game card onto it? And that is how we came up with Kicker. Now, the reason the Kicker is here is an important thing we need in game design is flexibility. That you want mechanics that have a lot of function, that you can do a lot of things with, that you can put a lot of places. Now, I will say Kicker is not my number one mechanic. Why not? Oh, sorry. The reason the, flexibility, the reason the flexibility is important, you want the opponent to have options. Players like to have choices. If you give them too many choices, it can, it can cause problems because they, they can't know what to do. Um, two things tend to be optimal. Sometimes we do three things with charms and stuff. Um, and once again, it, turn, it allows you to do turn three. It means one thing. Turn seven, it means another thing. OK, the problem with kicker. Everything is kicker. <laughs> Um, we joke in R&D that everything is kicker or split card. Um, kicker is so flexible, it is so broad, that um, I, with 2020 hindsight, maybe we would have made kicker not, just so it, we put mechanics on all the time that basically we could do as kicker, but we want to make new things. Um, and so the reason kicker is number five and not lower is it kind of, it's a little bit too broad. <laughs> it's too flexible. So it's number five. It made the top five. We would, if, if you told me I only had five mechanics to make magic with, I grab Kicker very fast. So I, I definitely want Kicker, but it was number five. Okay, number four, cycling. Okay, in Tempest. Again, Richard Garfield, very good designer. Um, he realized that there's this problem that happened. That sometimes you're playing a game of magic and this card you, you, couldn't do, like, you couldn't do anything with it. Maybe it was too expensive. Maybe it was narrow and it just doesn't fit the situation you're in. Maybe there's something about it just that you can't do at this point in the game. You know, it costs life, but it, you don't have enough life. Um, and what that means is those cards get stuck in your hand. So Richard is like, can we do anything about that? Can we do anything about cards getting stuck in your hand? So he said, what if you could trade those cards in for something else? Uh, and the idea was, well, what's the most valuable thing you could get? How about another card? And so cycling was born of Richard saying, well, we have cards that are narrow or cards that are expensive. We could put this on them. And then if you draw them early, well, you just cycle them away. And then you could get another card. Um, so he actually put it in Tempest. Richard was in Tempest. Richard actually wasn't in Urza Saga, by the way. He, he was on the Tempest design team. And uh, Tempest would... When I handed it in, this was my first set, there was too much stuff in it, and I had to take stuff out. So I took out two things. I took out Echo, and I took out Cycling, uh, both of which were the main mechanics for the next year. In fact, a little tidbit, for eight years after Tempest's, um, when we turned in Tempest, there was a card from the Tempest design file in every set for eight years. Anyway, a little time. Um, the reason the Cycling is awesome, it is functional. It has utility. There's a lot of things you can do with it. It goes on creatures. It goes on every card type that everybody can use it. It's, it's, it's 
very, very useful and very generic and goes in a lot of places. Uh, why is it number four? Um, it was lacking flavor. Uh, my, my problem with cycling is it doesn't mean anything. Like one of the things you want in a mechanic is you want it to mean something and you want the player to sort of connect to it. It's easier to learn if it, like, it represents something. And cycling, which is an awesome mechanic, there's things that are a little bit more flavorful in it. So it got to my number four. Okay, number three, transform. Okay, back in Innistrad of 2011, we were trying to figure out how to make werewolves. Magic had only done three werewolves in the history of the game before Innistrad. They all sucked, by the way. So we were like, okay, if we want Innistrad to shine, we gotta, what I said to my team was, if we can find a way to make, like, werewolves shine, we will, we'll do what we need to do. Like, we, we need, this was our, my, my goal. Like, let's make werewolves the most awesome thing ever. So there was a designer named Tom Lapilli. Um, he had worked on another trading card we make. We make a game called Duel Masters that sold in Japan. Um, basically, we wanted to break into the Japanese market. The plan was we would sell in Japan for a few years, then bring it over to the U.S. and be a big game in the U.S. for kids. The first part worked really well. The second part, not so well. We tried twice. Um, but the Duel Master still exists to this day. We made it over 20 years ago. It was made to be like a three-year game, and it's still going 20 years later. I was one of the designers. of There's five of us. But anyway, it's a good game. Um, Duel Master did something really cool. They made a card with two sides. There wasn't just a back. You could print on the back. Um, so Tom said, hey, what if we did that here? What if the werewolves were that? OK, so let me talk through a, a common problem that we have. We like doing cards that have two states. I, I, I showed you Werebear, where I've talked about Threshold before. So Werebear represents a man that transforms through lycanthropy into a bear. But the problem is, either we show you the man or we show you the bear. Like, yeah, we could put both of them on the creature type line, but it, it's not as compelling. Now, in contrast, let's say Gustav Shepard. He's a man that turns into, I mean, a wolf, not a bear, but he turns into a werewolf. And one side shows you the man, and the other side shows you the werewolf. That is so much more compelling. Uh, and it has, oh, and the other thing that we can do with this is, we could change card types. We could change the layout. We could just tell really, really cool stories that the idea of transforming allowed us to do something that we also look for in design. Flavor, I said I'd get back to it. Um, it's just really amazing flavor. The ability to have multiple card arts and tell a two-part story is just super valuable. It even inspired us to do modal double face cards, which is typically a separate mechanic, but related. Um, and transform, here's how good transform is. I have to tell my designers to stop using transform. They want to put it in every set, and I'm like, we can't put it in every set. So you know a mechanic's good when we're like, could we do a little less more of that mechanic? Um, double face cards have their challenges, by the way, from a printing standpoint and a logistics standpoint. That's why transform is number three, not number one. It does have some logistical issues, but it is super flavorful and a very, very popular mechanic. Okay, number two, landfall. Okay, so we go back to Zendikar. So Randy Bueller was my boss at the time, now it's Aaron. And we used to do a thing called the five-year plan. Now we have a whole ARC planning committee. In the past, I was the ARC planning committee. I would give plans for the next five years. That's my job as head designer. Um, but I had a lot of ideas, so I actually, I gave a seven-year pitch. And one of my ideas, I really thought that lands were super functional and that we could do cool things with lands. And so I pitched what I call lands of Palooza. It's a, it's a block all about lands. Randy wasn't super enthralled, so he made it the seventh, the seventh set in the seven-year plan. But eventually we got there. Uh, endurance is a very powerful uh, design tool. Just outlive everybody and keep going. Um, so Bill, by the way, was not fond of it. Bill likes some things, not others. Um, Bill said that I had two months, and after two months, if he didn't like the design, we weren't doing Lands of Belooza. So I had, we started designing land, uh, land mechanics. In two months, my team designed 46 mechanics. So I'm going to tell you about land design number 45. It was called Land Short. 
uh, it used land slot as a resource. So you could give up your land slot, not play your land, um, and you got a resource. So what happened? We did play tests and everybody got mana screwed because they stopped not playing the land. Um, it created self-imposed mana problems. That's the exact opposite of what you want to do as a designer. You don't want to make people do bad habits that make the game not proceed. Uh, you want inertia, right? Um, so we said, okay, what if we turn this upside down? What if instead, what if we rewarded them for doing what they wanted to do? Um, yay! <laughs> that went over really well. Um, the idea was the job is not to cause headaches. You're not, you're not trying to give pain to the players. This is another really important thing. You want to bring joy to the players. And one of the big lessons of Landfall is there's nothing wrong with rewarding them from doing the thing they want to do. Um, we've, we've, got, we've, we've learned, it spawned all the mechanics. Play enchantments, play creatures, play instants and sorceries. I promise we'll do Artifact Fall one day. It's come up in sets. I swear we will make it one day. Um, but anyway, that is why Landfall is my number two. Number one! See, you guys should, I hope you guys know what number one is. But number one is... Flashback. So in Odyssey, um, back then I used to work on the Pro Tour. I was in charge of the feature match area. And so my job was to run the feature match area. I would pick the feature matches. On the final day I would do the video stuff, do the finals. Um, but I spent a lot of time watching really good players play Magic. So I would always be there. I had to change the score, see the scoreboard. I had to change the scoreboard when someone won. Um, but one of the things that would happen is sometimes one player would be behind. And I would always imagine, what if there were things that were different? What if I granted like special powers to one of the players? Could they win? So one of the things about Magic that I thought about was that Magics were kind of like a match. They were one use. You lit them and they were gone. But wouldn't it be fun if you could use them again? Like, people like doing things twice. Um, what if you gave people a second chance? What if the card let you do it again? Um, and so the idea I came up with is using the graveyard. Um, and the idea is, what if cards in the graveyard, what if you could cast them out of the graveyard? So along comes Odyssey. It has a graveyard theme. I have a mechanic about casting things out of the graveyard. Um, and like I said, Second chance is so powerful. We've made a lot of mechanics around just do things twice. Um, and flashback has proven to be a super, super useful mechanic. We've done it time and time again. And unlike kicker and cycling, which are also great mechanics, it's a, it has flavor. It, flashback means something. It means remembering the past. And your graveyard is the past. And so the, one of the cool things about flashback is it is one of the most useful things we have, and it has amazing flavor. So that is why I picked it as my number one mechanic. OK, for all of you that were taking pictures constantly, I, I felt here's one picture if you want to remember my top 20. So here's my list of the top 20 mechanics. I've learned from doing slideshows enough that at the end, always re I, I did this for my 20 lesson, 20, uh, 20 years, 20 lesson speech. Always recap. So these are my 20 mechanics. So I want to take time to end by thanking you all for coming to MagicCon. Um, this is our first sold out MagicCon. Uh, it's been so great seeing everybody. And I, I will be around the floor. If you see me on the floor, I will always be happy to say hello, to sign a card, sign a play mat, to answer a question, to take a picture. Always happy to do that. The only thing is I, I'm not shaking hands. I will bump elbows with you. I have promised my wife I would not get sick. Already my scratchy throat, hoping that's for me talking too much and not getting sick. Um, but anyway, uh, that has been the 20 best mechanics of all time. And feel free to go online and argue why I'm wrong. That's fine. So.